Welcome back. This time we move on to the heady delights of NumPy 2D arrays, which are used for tables and matrices. You'll recall that the NumPy ND array type stands for n dimensional array. So far we've been doing n equals 1. We're now moving up in the world to n equals 2. How do you construct 2D arrays? Well, the first one is the obvious one. You pass in a parameter to the NumPy array constructor, which is a list of lists. And NumPy obligingly gives you back a matrix, if you like to think of it like that, or a table. So if I display the data in that manner, I get it printed out nicely like that, row-wise, with columns all lined up. I can also print it, and it comes out slightly differently, using spaces as separators, but again, nicely lined up in rows and columns. That's one way to create NumPy 2D arrays. The other is to use the various functions that construct the such things. So I can, for example, have an array of a 2D array of zeros by calling the zeros function. What I pass in as a parameter is now a tuple. It's a tuple specifying the shape. The shape is how many rows and how many columns. So if I want five rows with 10 items in each row, I call it like that. Be careful with those parentheses. You do need both of them. You can't get away with np.zeros510. Get an error. So. Notice I got floating point zeros. If I wanted integer zeros, then I have to ask for them. dtype equals np.int64, just as I did with NumPy1D arrays, except I got something wrong. Oh, I used the wrong version. I should have used the tuple version. Sorry, that should have been this one. Now I get my five rows by ten columns with integers at each location. There's also one or two new functions. Well, there's quite a few actually, but the only one I'm going to bother mentioning here is the NumPy identity. These functions return 2D arrays specifically. So a 5x5 five five matrix of ones is called the identity matrix, and I can use that to get it. Indexing these things is possibly a little less obvious. If I have my data and I want to pull out a row and column, I use a tuple index. This is a bit surprising, probably. Let's try it this way for a start. 2, 3. So this asks for the item at row 2, column 3. Nought 1, 2, there's row 2, there's column 3, nought 1, 2, 3. It's that 12. If I ask for the top left corner, that would be the nought nought item. If I want, as before, I want the, the minus 1, I want the top row, last item in that. That's the 4 element, that's that element there. It's a tuple. That's a bit surprising. It's also possibly surprising to recall that tuples are constructed with commas, not with the brackets exactly. So 5, 3, 4 is a tuple, 5, 4. So I don't need those parentheses. In fact, they're kind of bad form. So if I were to index like that, I get the same element as I got before. It's a much easier, nicer way to write it. So in general, you will not use parentheses for the tuples that are subscripts in NumPy. You can also use a... Oh, sorry, there was one thing I wanted to emphasise. It's on this slide here. The index is the row and the column. So this is row 0, column minus 1, or the last column. Note that this is different from Cartesian coordinates. If you think in Cartesian coordinates, you will think x-axis, y-axis. That's not what we're doing here. We're doing row down first, across is the columns. So it's the other way around, and of course directions are different as well. You can also index with tuples that are, are tuples of slices. So if I do data indexed from, by the tuple from 1 to 3 and 1 to 4, I get a submatrix. If you like, that's the 6, 7, 8, 10, 11, 12. That's that bottom right-hand bit the last three columns and the last two rows. This is a view. So if I were to run that view and assign to an element of it, let's pick the 0, 0th element of it and assign to that and set it equal to 7. If I now look at my data, I've mangled by setting a 7 at the 0, 0 element. Before I had 5, 6, 7, 8. Now I've got 5, 7, 7, 8. I clobbered that 7 by doing that assignment because the view I had was looking at those last two uh, rows, last three columns. 
So aliasing again, be cautious. Views are important in this game. I can omit the trailing element of a slice. I'll go back to this example here. I can omit the trailing element altogether and I get the essential assumption is that it's all columns. So this is rows one to three, all columns, which is equivalent to writing it like this, which is what NumPy assumes if I leave out that last subscript. I can also use load text to get my data out of a file. And for example, I have here a file called wingusts.txt, which you'll meet in the lab, which is a file with a header row. The columns of data are all separated by vertical bars. So the first column of the actual record rows is the location in Canterbury. The next is the date. And then there is the direction of the wind gust. This is the maximum wind gust received on that day at that site. Direction 278 degrees with a magnitude of 27.7 kilometers per hour. So let's suppose I'm just interested in these two columns, the wind gust direction and the wind gust speed. Then I can pick them up by using np.loadText. I have to enter the file name first of all, which is windgusts.txt. I have to say what the delimiter is, which is unusual, it's this vertical bar. I have to tell it to skip one row because the first row is a header. And I have to tell it which columns I want, which are columns 0, 1, 2 and 3. So use columns and this is a tuple 2 and 3. That's the end of the function. That gives me all of that data. If I want to store it somewhere of course I can do so. So 278 27.7, that's the first gust. 74, 6.1 is the second one, and so on. So I can then proceed to process that data. You'll do that in the labs. I'm not going to do any more on that. Notice that in general you get a 2D array, one row per line, and it's also important that the data that you enter into it has the same number of columns in every row, except the ones you skip. So you can skip rows as many as you like. And the data must be numeric. So we skipped over the column 0 and column 1 because they didn't make sense as numbers. There are ways of dealing with these, but I don't want to get into that now, if at all. The arithmetic you do on these things is element-wise just as it was with 1D arrays. So if I multiply all the data elements by 5, it's no great surprise that I get 5 times every value in that array. If I multiply data by data, this is not a matrix multiply. I get every item squared. So I had 1 times 1 is 1, 2 times 2 is 4, 3 times 3 is 9, and so on. I can, of course, add to all the other arithmetic operations to it. Data plus 4 adds 4 to all the items in data, and so on. And the last thing I want to look at in this video is applying functions to 2D arrays. So I've restarted, cleared my screen a bit. If I do np.sum of the data, you're probably not too surprised that I get the sum of all the elements, rows and columns. But what if I want to do the column sums or the row sums? Well, that turns out to be easy enough. We have to pass in an extra parameter, which most of the functions will take. So this parameter is called axis, and axis equals zero gives me the column sums. So there we have five and one are six and nine are 15, six and 10 are 16 and two are 18 or, some, or so on. So I've summed down this way. Note that the result is a 1D array, which is natural enough unless you come from a MATLAB background, in which case you're expecting everything to be a matrix. It's not a matrix, it's a list or a sequence or a, a, a 1D array really, it's the only term for it. I can also sum along the other direction by setting the axis to one. This gives me the row sums. So 2, 1, 3, and 3, 6, and 4, 10 is the sum of the first row, and so on. Again, a 1D array. And there's a whole lot of other NumPy functions that can be used in conjunction with axes. Some of them are really quite interesting and important. All and any are two quite interesting ones. So if I do data greater than, uh, let's say, 7, for example, or 6, I get an array of Booleans. If I then do np.all data greater than 6 along the applying along the rows axis equals 1 
then I get told which of the rows are all true. So this one is not all true, this one is not all true, the only one that's all true is that. In other words, the only row in that matrix which has all numbers greater than 6 is that row. That's quite powerful. np.any does the obvious thing, you can explore that one. There's all these other functions which can also apply to your matrices and take axes or axis as a parameter. So that's all I have time for in this video. Thanks for watching. Bye.